Hi, this is Harold Cooper, and before we jump into this podcast interview, I just wanted to share that I've been lucky enough over the last couple of years to have interviewed a bunch of other leading therapists and agents of change, really exploring their take on everything rapid change related. What you're about to see it was recorded a little while ago, but it still holds tremendous value if you're someone that wants to learn about how to help people make quick behavioral shifts. So I hope you enjoy, and to make sure you don't miss any of the new releases, then take action and click that subscribe button, and then you'll be kept in the loop when any new episodes come out. Welcome to the Rapid Change Matters podcast. My name is Howard Cooper, and for over 14 years now, I've been fascinated with helping people to create personal change quickly. But I still come across many who believe that lasting personal change has to take a long time consisting of reliving traumas or deep psychological analysis, or simply that flawed notion that understanding why you have a problem will somehow make it go away. I'm on a mission to get people who work therapeutically with others to shift their thinking and realize that these beliefs are not written in stone. Rapid change can happen. So, to help you open up to what's possible, I'm interviewing top therapists and agents of change who are out there getting real results with real people really quickly. Before we get to the interview, I just wanted to let you know that I've written a quick to read downloadable PDF on five strategies to amplify your client's response with some great tips on getting your therapeutic suggestions to really sizzle. You can download this for free from rapidchange.works, where you can also find all the information about this episode and episodes still to come. Now, over to the interview. Today, we are very privileged to be joined by Dr. Richard Bolstad, a heavyweight in the NLP training world. He is the author of over 12 books on NLP and is, according to Steve Andreas, a co-developer of the field, one of the finest NLP trainers out there. In fact, it was his book, Resolve, The New Model of Therapy, that first put him on my radar and helped me make many crucially important distinctions about change work that I'm very, very grateful for to this day. He brings a deeper knowledge of NLP to even those who may already be very familiar with the field, and he joins us today all the way from his home in New Zealand, where, whilst it's evening for me, I understand that it's very, very early in the morning for him. Welcome, Richard. Thank you very much, Howard. So um, let's just jump straight into this. Uh, how, uh, tell me about what you do and how you got started. Okay, well, I run, as you said, mostly NLP-based training, and uh, I, I do that on several different continents each year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how I got started was I, ha- I have a kind of professional um, collection of, of choices. Uh, I'm trained as a nurse. I'm trained as a teacher. Uh, and then I trained as a counselor and eventually ended up as a gestalt psychotherapist. And so uh, with that kind of background, I was obviously looking for some way of influencing other people. Um, and I came across NLP and was completely skeptical about it. And so this is uh, around 40 years ago. Um, and I eventually ended up training as a Uh, as an NLP practitioner, master practitioner and trainer uh, because of my skepticism. So I I wanted to prove it wrong and it it kept working. And so I ended up using that as my main modality, helping people. I guess there was a there was a changeover moment where I was working with a guy one day and I was doing psychotherapy. He came in, he said he had a phobia and I realized I had a 10 minute technique that uh, would change this for him. And I remember the kind of internal conversation that I had with myself where I was thinking, will I just help this guy fix this in the next 10 minutes and he can go home and I'll never see him again? Or will we work for the next six months exploring all the meaning of this and so on? And I decided I couldn't live with myself if I if I wasted his six months of of time and money. So that's that's how I got into it, really. I think that's really interesting, and especially that you, you've almost touched on something that's uh, very close to my heart, which is um, I think there are some therapeutic models that almost incentivize therapists for being ineffective or slow. I, I agree 100%, and uh, I'm in a very useful situation in that way, and, and 
in that I had that background as a psychotherapist like that. And I think uh, part of the training of psychotherapists in general is to help them focus on their own um, personality, their own kind of self image. Mm. And then they kind of do that with the people who come in to see them, regardless of whether those people actually wanted the entire kind of electrical system reorganizing or whether they just wanted a light bulb changed. And I, I, I kind of eventually understood that most people don't want the whole system reorganized. They just want a light bulb change. And one of the things that actually uh, helped me to understand that was thinking, if I had someone in my family who had a problem like this, would I want them to waste the next 10 years exploring all the meaning of it behind it? Or would I want to find someone who could just help them fix it in an hour? So, <laughs> so, so how did you go from being you know, having a cynicism uh, about, you know, this field that we call NLP to, you know, being able to sit with someone and say, well, hey, guess what? I've got a psychotherapeutic uh, knowledge and background, but I've also got, you know, this kind of 10 minute phobia cure and maybe that's what I should do. How did you, did you get to be able to just go for it in terms of trying this stuff out for real? Uh, well, I... I continue to be, in fact, a very kind of skeptical guy. And uh, the, the way that I do skepticism is if I've got something I disagree with or I, I think is nonsense, then I like to explore it enough so that I've kind of imagined all the things that someone might say to me in defense of it, and I've got an answer for those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I can psychotherapize that. I can theorize that it came from my childhood. But certainly, certainly that's, that's a kind of modus operandi that served me well, and, and I did it in this case. So, uh, so actually, as I, uh, as I approached NLP, I wanted to find the evidence, and the evidence just kept getting harder and harder in this case. You know, I, I know that NLP has a kind of a background as a, um, as a pseudo, and it, it certainly can be used that way. Mm -hmm. The way that I uh, think of it is, is like soap that you wash your hands with, it actually works. But if you watch the adverts for soap, you'd think it was bullshit because the, the, adverts, the adverts are implying that uh, something magical is going to happen when you use this soap. It's going to make you glamorous. It's going to turn you into an actor or an actress. And, and that's just not true. That part, the presentation is the pseudoscience, but not the soap itself. I, I, it's the same with NLP. I don't know if that washes with everyone, but no. I mean, I, and I'm I'm, I'm going to say a few things, and I'm not even sure that exactly what my question is. But these are just kind of thoughts sure. and, and ideas that are of playing around with when I knew that we were going to be speaking today. Which is, there's a lot of material that you've presented, certainly in in Resolve, certainly towards the big, uh, the first part of it, where it's looking at some of the research that's been done to back up um, NLP and some of the exp uh, you know the evidence based information around it. And I think that there's a thrust at the moment within therapeutic change work to being very evidence-based. But then on the other hand, you speak to people who are very focused on, well, guess what? I don't have to worry about what the science says. I do it if it's useful. If it's useful, that's more important than whether it's true. And one of the things that struck me about you is that you kind of, and I don't know whether this is a fair thing to say, but kind of struggle both camps of that area quite nicely in that there's an evidence-based thrust but also you know hey guess what if it's if it's useful does it have to be true a hundred percent yeah uh that's that's exactly where i would put myself in in both those camps because i do think it's important to be able to check things out and i don't think we should be limited by what's already been checked out um if I can, again, use a, a metaphor of another field from my, my nursing background, I know that uh, there's been a lot of cynicism and skepticism in terms of, of medical approaches to cleansing diets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for, for the last 20 years, um, medical practitioners and researchers have run a campaign warning people that there's no such thing as a cleansing diet. You can't actually cleanse your system by taking in certain things or uh, by fasting and, and uh uh, drinking uh, certain teas, but in fact, you actually can. And the research over the last five years has been pretty conclusive about that, that actually if people fast, if they stop eating um, 
for a few days, then their body will uh, make certain changes. It will actually cleanse out old cells and it will rejuvenate uh, new cells. And so what that what that means is that we, we missed something in medicine before. Um, we, we didn't have the research showing that before, so we kind of laughed at it. And so what I would say is it was useful to do what actually works, but it is useful to be skeptical and it's useful to actually check things. Now, the, the biggest evidence for that importance of checking things that I have is something I mentioned in the Resolve book there, and it's a research study done in California back in the 1950s. And they had 500 children who were identified as at risk. They divide them into two groups. One group gets psychotherapy or counseling. So those were two options. And the other group gets uh, just followed up. And they follow them up over five years. At the end of five years, all the kids who have had psychotherapy and counseling say that psychotherapy or counseling was fantastic. It totally saved them from all the terrible things that could have happened in their life. And the only problem with this inspiring research is that those kids actually did much worse in every parameter that they could check compared to the other kids. So they are more likely to be in jail, they're more likely to be addicted, they're more likely to be suicidal, they're more likely to be on psych psychotherapeutic drugs. And what that tells us is people can feel nice about what's happened, even though it's screwing up their life. Yeah. And uh, so <laughs> I think that's that's the other side of the issue is it's important to be skeptical about just feeling good about stuff. Yeah, very, very interesting uh, because essentially what it means is that, you know, certainly if you're working therapeutically with people, um, it, it means that we should be looking at what they're doing and what they're achieving rather than just their own internal feeling about it. Any any time that uh, people tell you, well, you know, such and such percentage of my clients report that they feel really good afterwards, then you, you know that they're nice people, but you don't know that they're therapeutically effective yet until you find out what actually specifically what those people are trying to change and what's the situation with that now. And, the, you know, the classic story of that is Sigmund Freud, of course, who uh, when someone actually got into following up all of his clients, they found that all of them had exactly the same problems at the end of their life that they had at the start, except for one poor lady who, of course, had had died of the stomach cancer that Freud diagnosed as, as being a psychosomatic problem due to her masturbation. So... Uh, so, yeah, we need to have that kind of skepticism. Otherwise, thousands of psychotherapists around the world will waste their time uh, following the instructions of someone like Freud, if I can state that rather strongly. <laughs> no, no, I've had, I've had a number of guests on the, uh, the podcast who have stated many things about Sigmund Freud rather strongly, too. Um, it's, it's nice to hear that, you know, things, things move on. You know, yes, uh, and and why not? Um, are there any dangers to working uh, with people uh, in a kind of a rapid fashion going after a result? Yeah, I think there are as well, and you can see that in the marketing of NLP. Uh, the first danger is that if I act like I am a magician, so I have this power, this magic ability to change people, then uh, a certain percentage of the time that will work, and we know how. That works in the brain, actually. There was some research just released yesterday showing that people are in their brain much more motivated to be convinced when someone comes across as certain about what they're doing. So it's quite tempting to act like a magician. The problem is that if I act like I'm the magician and I have this kind of secret technology that they don't need to know about that can fix them, then it disempowers them. So firstly, if it doesn't work, then they have no fallback because the magic didn't work. They, they just have to look for another magician. And secondly, though, even if it does work, it works by implying that they can't control their own brain. The exact opposite of what I'd actually like to imply to people. So that's, that's the very first uh, uh, danger. And then the second danger is that it's important to distinguish between rapid change and, and personal growth. You know, that, that thing I said that psychotherapists are trained to help people with personal growth. So they, they, they have clients who come in wanting a certain change. They shift them to focusing on their life in general and the meaning of it all. And uh, knowing what is what is quite important. Sometimes people will want personal growth and you can't do that in an hour. And that's, uh, that's important. Sometimes people will come in to see me and their outcome will be, I want to transform myself as a person. 
Well, that's not going to happen in an hour. And in fact, uh, the kind of stuff I do, I'm probably not the best person to guide them through it. You mean you don't run the five-minute transform their person process? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And <laughs> and you can hear that that makes really good marketing. You know, your life will be completely different after this. Uh, it's just it's just that uh, it, it's not really like that. And so there's a there is a real risk of presenting NLP as the magic instead of presenting people's own minds and brains as, as mm. being the magic, which is what I'm aiming for. I, I think. And I'm, I, there's kind of something connected with this, which is I remember when I was first doing training in NLP and seeing them bring up demo subjects, you know, these great top trainers bring up the demo subjects, they do yep. some change work, they do it, it last 10 minutes, and that person is radiating, they're beaming from ear to ear. And I remember first learning about this field thinking, wow, that person's never going to have any problems ever again. You know, and yeah. there's that kind of feeling, well, well, they had 10 minutes with this, this NLP great, and therefore, they're fixed forever. And the truth is, is that, you know, life happens. And, uh, and I think that's okay. I think it's, it's better to have an empower, uh, a feeling of empowerment around it, that people can, you know, change themselves rather than they, they just have it done to them. Absolutely. And as far, of course, as far as demonstrations go, it's important to notice that uh, there is, we might call it a placebo effect of actually doing a demonstration in front of a large group of people, that the person who comes up assumes that you are going to be able to succeed. And and this uh, demonstration phenomenon was, was first commented on by uh, Carl Rogers back in the 1950s. And he, he said he noticed that his demonstrations always went much better than his personal sessions. Mm -hmm. So most most people will discover that, that when they actually uh, start working individually with people, there's no uh, build up of expectations because there's no whole group kind of watching and expecting this change. And it doesn't work as simply. And then the other thing is, as you say, someone can have a profound experience on stage with Tony Robbins or something. And, and then afterwards, they go away and... Uh, um, realize that there are some other things that they kind of forgot about on stage, but that are still there. And I actually think it's very useful, especially with things like anxiety, for people to understand what you just said, which is, uh, to put it in New Zealand English, should happen sometimes. And, uh, and, and that's part of life. And you're not meant to be anxiety free. You're actually meant to be able to uh, have anxiety when you walk across the road and a car nearly hits you, but actually recover from it and bounce back. So uh, so that in itself is an important thing that sometimes people with anxiety need to, need to get a handle on is that there is no magic fix. So how would you frame um, a therapeutic interaction if someone rings you up and says, you know, I just need some help with this and if you can't fix me, you know, then I don't know what I'll do. You're my last hope. Yeah. Uh, well, usually my aim, instead of reassuring them, my aim is to get the hell out of that model and to tell them that what I do is I have some understandings about how their brain works and my plan will not be actually to uh, to fix them or to do something magic, but to do something that's more educational. I, you know, I guess I come from a teaching background as well. And so I usually explain to people, look, what I'm going to do is show you how to run your brain and how to get better results yourself. Um, so I, I, in contracting, I contract with someone, here's what we're planning to do, here's how long it's possibly going to take, here is uh, what you can expect and, and not expect, and here is my role. So I, I need to clarify certain things that are my role and certain things that aren't. So I'm not responsible for the change, that's one thing. I'm not going to set the outcomes, that's their business as well but I'm in, actually in charge of the processes that I guide them through um, because otherwise people will come in and ask me to do things like their last therapist did and that only gets us to the same place their last therapist got. So all of that's part of what I say to people and what I, what I send them in, a, uh, in an email before we start. So this is not, I mean, because I spoke to some therapists and, you know, an inquiry comes in and, you know, they have someone else handle the inquiry the first time they meet the person is in the session. And they don't really know what to expect, but you're suggesting that actually that there's there's some framing of context ahead of time. Yeah, I think the 
of course, the, the first contact you have with someone is, is usually nowadays what they saw of you online. And then uh, the, the second thing is to find out what things in, in that they focused on. So there's a bit that it's useful to have happen before the person comes into the room. And the research from the solution focused people is, is kind of pretty relevant about this, that they, they show that uh, just giving a person, for example, the task of paying attention to what improves between the time they first contact you and the first session, that in itself is a therapeutic intervention. So, uh, so I'm very aware of that, that um, what you do from the moment something is said to the person is part of the session as well. I, I, I quite agree. And actually, it's, it's amazing how many people come uh, and walk into a session and say, I don't know how or why, but... Uh, things have seemed yep. better just knowing I was coming. And I think there is, yep. you know, there's something about taking that first step of even making an appointment. That's right. And, and you know, in the, in the solution-focused model, they would encourage us to say, and I always do say, like, wow, that's, that's fantastic. What do you think you did that has made that change? And that, of course, presupposes that they did something. It wasn't just magic. It wasn't just kind of some healing energy I sent over the airwaves. And... Uh, and, and when I ask them that question, then they'll say, well, I guess I, I kind of focused hopefully on, on what could be different. And I, I paid attention to it before things happened each time now. And, uh, and then, of course, what I'm going to do is build on that rather than throw something in from outside. I'm going to say, right, so what we need to do is just work out how you can do that more. On a different note, how yep. closely related do, do you... Um find uh, hypnosis is with NLP and how would you define hypnosis? What role does that have within the uh, the NLP practitioner's toolbox? Uh, for me, hypnosis is another frame. So, uh, so NLP with its understanding of the sensory systems and so on is one frame that I'm using. Uh, perspective for looking at things and hypnosis is another frame for for what I'm doing and it's it's possible for me because I teach hypnosis as well it's possible for me to explain everything I do including these things I'm saying now as being hypnosis uh, of course famously Bandler and Grinder when they were first teaching hypnosis in the NLP world one of them would say everything is hypnosis and the other one would say no that's not true there's no such thing as hypnosis nothing is hypnosis and I agree with both them. Uh, I think that uh, it's a framework for understanding things rather than the specific techniques. And, you know, Milton Erickson was very clear about that himself, that he was not so much interested in the techniques that he was doing as in utilizing what the other person was doing. And he really thought of um, when he was asked, what's the name of what you do? He didn't say it was Ericksonian therapy. He said it was utilization. And uh, so I, I think of that as being my task and you could call utilization hypnosis or you could call it something else but that's um that's that's for me how it fits in having said that i do uh, teach people what are specifically hypnotic techniques but that's um that's because they're techniques that anyone who communicates with someone else would would want to learn anyway they just happen to be discovered by hip hypnotists really do, do you think that people who are seeking, for example, a hypnotherapist, have different yep. expectations from someone who's seeking um, an NLP practitioner uh, or a, a change work consultant. Yeah, those both those both carry risks, uh, and and so does uh, someone who's seeking, you know, spiritual transformation or something. Each of these um, entry points has advantages and and risks. And uh, one of the advantages of the person who seeks hypnosis is that they already get the idea that um, just thinking through stuff may not be everything we need to do. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that they may have the idea that they don't have to think through things. I'm going to take charge of what's going on. Um, their idea of hypnosis is quite likely to be contaminated by uh, stage hypnosis from television. So, uh, so the the thing I'm always alerted to when someone says they want hypnosis is do they think that I'm going to do something while they're actually asleep? Because that's just, you know, I, I don't do sleep therapy. So so that's something I need to explain right at the start then. So, although isn't there some research that says that uh, there are some benefits from uh, playing stuff while you're asleep? 
<laughs> yeah, there are. It, what it does is... I think it may have even been you that, po- the, 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 that posted it, I think. Um... <laughs> what it shows <laughs> is that when you are asleep, of course, you're reconsolidating memories. And, uh, and which memories you reconsolidate, which memories you pay attention to and, and uh, kind of file more adequately in your brain, uh, can be influenced by what's happening around around you so that if you play auditory um, instructions that remind your brain of a certain event that happened during the day like simply replaying a training session that you did during the day then your brain will reconsolidate that memory more than other memories Um, and that's kind of an advantage Uh, it doesn't tell you exactly how your brain will reconsolidate those memories uh, and it doesn't also make for a good night's sleep so you know, I, when I posted that, I had several people say that, oh, yeah, I use that, and it's, it's hell for my sleep. <laughs> well, you say that. I mean, I, I've been playing Russian every night to myself, and I still can't speak a word of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that, that was kind of debunked way, way back in the 1960s. <laughs> you can't actually do the learning while you're asleep. But if you do the learning during the day, and then you play it while you're asleep, it helps uh, strengthen the memories. <laughs> that's where I've been going wrong. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a good metaphor for what um, what happens in a session. As I, I explained to the person, look, uh, I'm going to communicate with your conscious and unconscious mind to use that metaphor, and it is only a metaphor. Uh, and as I as I do that, you actually got to do stuff consciously. Uh, so sometimes what people are hoping, understandably, is they're hoping that they can carry on doing the same thing they always did, and I'll do something that's different. And that's what they pay me for. You know, they're, they're paying me money to do the different thing while they can carry on uh, being comfortable doing the same thing they always did. That's not really going to happen. What advice would you have for other, I would say, uh, fairly new uh, change workers, people who were, you know, fairly early on in their careers, they've done the training, uh, and they're now going from, I've been in the room doing the training to I'm sitting there with a real patient, real client. Okay. Uh, the key advice that I and I give this advice to people on the trainings as well is that just learning more techniques is not what you need now. So once you have uh, some some basic ideas about how to work with people, working with people is what you need, and then you need to be able to reflect on what happened and learn from it, so that you don't make the same mistake a thousand times, but you actually learn from each each event. And that means talking over what happened with someone else. Uh, who's who's been doing this for a while so you can call that supervision or peer support or wh- whatever you like but that process I think is pretty important and um, what it is is it's the difference between someone who is a beginner in any field and someone who's an expert in that field so this research comes from uh, some brothers in, in California again actually the Dreyfus brothers people can look that up online and, and their research is about the development of expertise what they show is that in any field they studied nursing they, they studied uh, chess players for example when you start off in a field you are trying to follow the rules and then you get to the point where you have okay guidelines about when this rule is important and when it's not and Uh, then you start kind of being very flexible with the guidelines so that whoever comes in, you've got guidelines for what's going on. But that's not how experts work. Experts do not in their head constantly think of guidelines. What they do is they access familiar memories of people who were similar to the person in front of them or chess games that were similar to the game in front of them. So it almost seems intuitive. What they're doing is utilizing their uh, backlog of experiences and um, so they, they seem to almost have a more automatic response to the situation. That happens in any field, and it happens in this process of change work as well. So what I want to encourage people to do is to build up that uh, backlog of experiences, really cross-referenced, so that when someone comes in to see them, they almost have a sense of familiarity uh, about what's going on. And uh, so, and that that's benefited not by learning more techniques. More techniques will will distract them to the other side of things. It'll distract them to the rules and memorizing stuff and take them away from the person who's in front of them. So is it fair to say that when you're working with someone, um, you get to a level where your choice and selection of where you're going or what techniques or what ideas you're presenting aren't necessarily consciously thought about. You haven't sat there and gone, oh, well, that person 
uh, guess what, you know, oh look, they're up and visually constructed right now, and therefore I must do X, Y, and Z. Uh, the, there's a, a gut response that's come through yeah. training. It's come through, uh, yeah, through through the multiple experiences and reflecting on them. So to, to give a simple example, most people listening will know how to drive a car, and they'll know that when you're if you think back to the very first times when you're driving in a car, you're constantly thinking about what is the situation I'm in and what do I need to do next? So if you have to back a car into a parking space, then you have in your mind certain theories about uh, which point you turn the wheel and uh, uh, how you how you check what's going on. And of course, when someone is familiar with with driving and backing a car into a parking space, they're not thinking about that at all. In fact, they almost have in their mind a sense of familiarity about the situation that they're in. Now, it's not the same situation as they've ever been in before. There's always subtle differences, but their brain is paying attention to their um, to their memory of how to how to do this, rather than to the theory about how it should should work. And I think that's true in good uh, therapy and good change work as well. Going back to, to our good old friend uh, Sigmund Freud. For a second, and yep. all that that kind of uh, encompasses. How far is it important to explore someone's past to be able to change their future? Uh, the best way I, I would explain it to someone is that the past is a metaphor that your brain is using to understand what's happening now. And uh, so, since it's a metaphor that your brain is using, it's sometimes useful to use that metaphor, but never get fooled into thinking that the past is actually a thing that you can somehow access because your brain was not at all interested in storing memories of the past. It, it has no interest in, uh, in making a video. It has, has no kind of photo album of the past. The only reason why your brain responds to experiences by what we call memory is that it's trying to work out what to do next time we get into a similar situation. And so what it stores is essentially instructions uh, when you see this, or you hear this, or you touch this, then do this. And uh, so I, I know that makes it sound very mechanistic, but what it reminds us is that the sophisticated memories that we think we have of experiences are purely designed as instructions for what to do next. Um, so every time we have a re-experience of that, and the research just accumulates every year about this, every time we have a, a new experience, that is related to other experiences, it changes our memory of the other experiences. So that, that means you can never go back to the way the memory was at the start because each similar memory has altered your experience of that original memory. And um, uh, so as long as we understand that, then we can use your brain's uh, kind of metaphor of the past in order to help you change. But there's no... <laughs> You know, there's there's no set memory as as people usually think of it. So, I mean, one word that you used there is an interesting one to me, which was people might view it as mechanistic. And yeah. I wonder whether there are psychotherapists or counsellors who hear, you know, this kind of NLP approach being talked about in this mechanistic way, and may have a reaction of, well, hang on, is, does it not just lack empathy? You know, we're reducing people down to nuts and bolts, just strategies and processes, rather than, mm. you know, really looking at what something matters to someone at a feeling level. How, how would you respond to that kind of uh, accusation? Yeah, that's, uh, that's also, it's also important, of course, uh, to understand that this person that we're dealing with is not just someone who has a, a brain, but someone who has a brain which is designed to respond differently to human situations and in all sorts of ways that we don't understand even yet. And so uh, so the, the best guideline, of course, is, thank goodness, most psychotherapists are still human beings, and so the best guideline is to be a human being with this person. That means that there's no really uh, profoundly helping people without congruently caring about them. And uh, so I, I guess I disagree with Richard Bandler's comments about that. He's, he says, I, I think I proved pretty effectively that you don't have to have empathy for people to help them change. And <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's, that's kind of true. But if you want them to feel good about 
themselves and the change afterwards than you kind of do because human beings are constructed that way. But when a doctor goes in and uh, helps someone to heal from a broken bone or something like that, it helps them to know both things, that this is a person and that how their healing process happens will depend on treating them as a person rather than as a machine. But it also helps to know where the bone is and uh, what kind of break this is and, and how exactly mechanistically we would need to deal with it. So, uh, so I wouldn't want to lose track of either of those things. So how would you, I mean, it's interesting talking about you don't need, uh, the, the statement of you don't need empathy um, to be able to affect change. How would you define the difference between empathy and rapport? And is there a difference? Well, this is something that I, I changed my mind about quite a few times uh, as I trained as a psychotherapist and then as an NLP practitioner. And, you know, uh, there was an idea in early NLP that rapport is mechanistic, that it's purely a matter of uh, uh, you kind of synchronize with someone else and then you can take them somewhere else. And I, I remember that Bandler and Grinder would always say, don't ever think it's real. Don't ever think that you actually are understanding people more just because you're synchronized with them, uh, even though they might think that. And I think that the research since then has kind of contradicted that, that in fact, uh, it's, it's not just mechanistic and there's really no way to synchronize with someone else without your brain starting to get a feeling for what it's like inside that person. Uh, and if there is a way, it's, it's, uh, it usually gets diagnosed as autism. So, so for, for most of us human beings, if you synchronize with someone else, you will start to feel what it's like inside them. And so that, that means there's no rapport completely separate from what you'd call empathy. And uh, neither should we try and, and make there any. <laughs> so so uh, like to give you an example, when the most dramatic research we have about relationships, perhaps, is the research by John Gottman and was first drawn to public attention in the book Blink. And so John Gottman has shown that by watching five minutes of a couple talking, uh, he can accurately predict with 96% certainty, will this couple be together in 12 years? Mm. And he can predict with 80% certainty which year they'll split up. And how he does that is essentially by watching what we would call rapport. So if there's no synchronization between the two people, then their relationship is in trouble and you can measure it accurately enough so you can be 96% certain what's going to happen in their, in their relationship. And um, what what that means is that rapport is not just a, a kind of a mechanistic thing that has an effect at one moment. It's part of this larger way that human beings and animals in general relate to each other. Uh, Richard, have you got any examples of um, people that you've worked with and they've come in one way um, and they've yeah. left having had some kind of transformation that many people from perhaps traditional models of uh, therapeutic intervention would go, hang on a second, that can't be real. You can't do that. Really? <laughs> yeah, I've got, uh, I've got hundreds of those. Uh, let me give you one that I think has several kind of uh, um, learnings that attached to it. And that is, you know, one of the places that I worked was in Sarajevo and in Pale, which are, are the, were on the two different sides of the uh, – the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And uh, so I was working there in Sarajevo and I, I trained the psychiatrists there the first time I went there. And um, so we have this room full of psychiatrists. I say, okay, I want to demonstrate with someone this process, which is called the NLP trauma process. Uh, some people will know it as the uh, movie rewind process. And so I I asked for a demonstration and this guy says, can this be something not to do with the war? Because I have a, another kind of problem. So I said, well, sure, you know, uh, what's the deal? And he says, well, uh, when I was 18 years old, I went out on my first date and uh, with this beautiful young woman and we met in, in the old city in Sarajevo, uh, which is one of these lovely European old cities. And um, he said she, <laughs> she met me there and she reached inside her blouse and she said, I've got something to show you. And I have no idea what he expected her to take out from there. But what she actually took out was a little white mouse. And so she had a pet mouse. Now, when he saw that mouse in a kind of shock, so he jumped back because, you know, he really didn't expect something moving to come out of there, I guess. And uh, then 
he he kind of meta commented to himself about what had just happened. So then he thought to himself, oh, my goodness, I've acted like I was frightened of her pet. And I've just, you know, I've just humiliated myself in front of her. And so that, of course, triggered this enormous response in his brain, you know, of humiliation and uh, uh, just feeling awful about what was happening. And he turned and he ran. And so he ran away from her. They never had the date. And that was only the beginning of something much bigger, which was he developed and his brain could have done all sorts of things with this. And I guess he's lucky that he didn't develop a phobia of women's chests or something. He developed a phobia of mice. And so that that was kind of just an annoying phobia of, of uh, mice until the war began. Now, when the war began and uh, Sarajevo was being shelled, if the siren sounded, people had to go into the nearest building and down into the cellar immediately. They didn't sort of say, you know, excuse me, if you don't mind, can I pop in and have a cup of tea or something? They just ran into the nearest place, ran down into the cellar to get away from the shells. Well, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it because down in those basements, there would be mice. And so uh, so there he is standing in the street knowing that he could be blown to pieces at any moment. And that in his brain is not as significant as uh, the fact that a, a, an innocent little mouse might be down there and probably the mouse is going to be terrified of him. And yet he couldn't he couldn't face that. He'd rather face death. So that tells you that what happens is not as powerful as the way the brain handles it. So, of course, uh, I ran him through this process. The process literally took quarter of an hour with the translation as well. And then at the end of that process, when he thought of this, he felt com when he thought of mice, he felt completely relaxed. So that's a that's a profound change. And what it reminds us, though, is that it's not because I have some magic that's more powerful than bombs. Actually, his brain has a magic that is so powerful that it would put him through hell rather than get him to face what his brain accidentally uh, mistook as being a dangerous situation. Yeah, so quarter of an hour and, and he never had that problem again. I, I went back the next year and, and checked. It, it actually reminds me that there's... A number of people that I've heard talk about the idea that your unconscious, if we explore that model for a second in that frame, that your unconscious yep. is designed to protect you, it's designed to keep you safe, it's not necessarily designed to make you happy. But then stories like that would perhaps contradict an aspect of that because it's saying, well, hey, guess what? I would rather give him this terrible anxiety about going to the basement where there might be mice, which I'm, at that stage I'm phobic of, than standing out here in the open and risk being bombed. So can those two well, kind of things exist, uh, those kind of uh, thoughts, those frames work together? Well, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the, the evolutionary biology of, of the brain. And uh, yeah, I, I think the, the answer is a little more sophisticated than most people's idea of, of evolution suggests. It, it's certainly true that uh, your brain is designed to keep you alive in order to get you to have babies. Um, and that, that's not because it's got some malevolent plan or something. It's just because that's the way nature works. However, uh, in keeping you alive, obviously, <laughs> pleasure and uh, both pleasure and what we might call this bigger field of happiness um, are kind of useful. They're just not always the most useful thing in keeping someone alive. And, and so, uh, so it's true from the research that our brain prioritizes survival and um, it does some things which which incline people. It's more easy to get miserable than it is to get happy, in fact. Um, that doesn't mean that the brain likes misery. It just means that uh, the brain likes you to stay alive um, and it figures that that's, that's kind of worth it even if there is suffering. So this is the first time that this kind of philosophical question has uh, has come up in the human species, you know, is in, in the last few thousand years. And we're really sort of working out, OK, do we want to be happy? And if we want to be happy, um, how do we use this extraordinary brain that was not exactly designed for that, but that can actually create happiness? And, you know, I'm very, very interested in that. And I think there are people who are way, way ahead of the game with this, because in Asia, where I also teach quite a lot, um, there is this long tradition, uh, most people will know that the research on happiness has been uh, significantly interacting with the uh, 
Buddhist philosophers. And there is this long tradition of research into what we would now call happiness. How do you uh, train your brain to be more happy? Because that is that is certainly possible. It's It just wasn't the number one priority of evolution. Do you think there's been an increase in depression as expectations of people wanting to be happier or expecting or feeling that they have a right to be happier has increased? Yeah, because... Uh, there are several important things to understand about that. The the, Im, the increase in measured depression is like more than tenfold. So something is really not working about that. And the people who are experts in research on this, like Martin Seligman, uh, what they say is that it's exactly what you're saying, that we have developed an expectation that we ought to be happy all the time, and that if we're not happy, then something terrible has happened. And in fact, if, if we're not happy, that just is feedback that tells us, okay, the uh, we need to investigate and do something different here. So uh, so the idea that people have developed is that if you're not happy, then something is going wrong. And that's, that's not an evolutionary kind of sensible thing to believe. Uh, on the other hand, it's possible to to learn how to enjoy your life more. It certainly is. And, and one of the things people need to understand about that is that more misery doesn't make more happiness either. I, I know I've been to some countries where that's a very strong cultural belief that in order to be happy, you know, the highs are only measured by the lows. And so you have to suffer first. And I think that um, has been promoted by religions like Christianity to, you know, I, I know I came from a Christian background myself, but frankly, this idea that you get tortured on a cross and then you'll go to heaven um, is a very strong belief in those countries where where that system has been popularized. Uh, and it's wrong. It's it's just uh, it it's just not what the research shows. In fact, people who are good at being happy, damn it, they just get more and more happy. And uh, people who get good at being miserable, they, they just get more and more miserable. It doesn't make them more able to enjoy life. Uh, any secrets you could give our listeners over tips to be happier? Yeah, uh, there. And and you've got ten seconds to do it in. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just laughing at exactly that. Yeah, uh, there are. And, you know, one of the most important things, of course, to understand is that actually how pe it's very hard for people to believe that how they think has has some relationship to their happiness uh, or to their misery. Uh, but it but it does. And mostly the relationship is that more thinking is not really good for happiness. And so <laughs> so, you know, the. The most famous research about this is the research looking at people who become tetraplegic. So they're, they're actually paralyzed from the neck down and following them up two years later and realizing that they're actually often quite happy two years later. And they're happier, for example, uh, than people who have won the lottery, which doesn't mean we should all go out and have car accidents. What it means is there is something that goes on when a person realizes, you know what, happiness is not really going to come from external pleasure as much as it used to. I've got to take charge of this. So the first thing is realizing, I think, that we need to take charge of our own brain in order to find happiness, that it's not going to just happen. It's not, um, it, it's not something that is our birthright for every moment or something like that. It's actually, it's a learned thing like anything else. Uh, the other thing is to know that some of the processes that people do inside their head that seemed like they were working when they were a kid, and so they've rehearsed them again and again, like asking why did this happen and asking uh, what if really bad stuff happens next, that some of the stuff does not lead to happiness. Um, so, you know, we have <laughs> quite a bit of research again about this. It, it, do, it not only doesn't lead to happiness, it doesn't make you live very long. So, so some of the things that um, that people do when they have a challenge in their life that worked for small things do not work with the big things like, am I going to uh, die of this disease that I've contracted or something like that? In those really big situations, being careful about the way you think to yourself predicts living longer. Richard, thank you so much. It's been uh, not just fun talking to you, but absolutely insightful and uh, fascinating. If people want to hear more about the work you do or get in touch, um, have you got any links? Where, where can they go? What can they do? Absolutely. In fact, uh, on uh, on my internet site uh, at www.transformations, with an S, .net .nz or .nz, uh, that's the New Zealand site. On that site, we have five 
full days of training MP3s that you can download uh, with the manuals. So you can go through the, how we would introduce this stuff and uh, also go through the work that I do in places like Sarajevo and, and uh, places where there's been a tsunami or something like that. So, uh, so the core stuff, I I couldn't live with myself if I if I kept it for people who pay to come to the trainings either. Uh, so it's there and you can and you can download it definitely. Absolutely fantastic. Well, we will put on the uh, as normal on the iTunes episode guide and on the RapidChange.Works website links uh, that you've mentioned as well so that people should find it nice and easy to uh, to click through uh, and find it. Um, is there anything that we, when you thought, oh, you know, we're going to do this uh, interview uh, and this chat about rapid change uh, as a theme, is there anything that you would like to add that hasn't come up but actually you think would be worth sharing with people? Uh, one thing that I'm, I might say a little more strongly is that because this process that I do to help someone change depends on me being human and them being human, um, that how I am as a human being has a lot to do with the effectiveness of the change. And so um, so when I'm training, I'm constantly aware as, as well what I'm what I'm doing is not just showing people not just showing people certain specific skills, but showing them how would you get to do whatever it is that I'm I'm doing. Uh, so I I I want to emphasize that I think it's equally important to enjoy your own life um, as to sort of pay attention to how to help other people enjoy their life. Richard, thank you again. Um, absolutely fascinating to talk and um, yeah, really appreciate your time on behalf of me and the listeners. Thanks very much, Howard. It's a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, why not share it with anyone you think might be interested and even head over to iTunes to give us a glowing review. You'll find more about what's coming up on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash rapid change works. And of course, you'll find all the links related to this episode, plus those free five steps to getting your suggestions to sizzle over at rapidchange.works.